Hi, everyone. Um, so, yesterday, some of you came to hear about digital transformation. Thank you for listening, and I hope it was helpful. Uh, today, I was uh, asked by Maya to talk about content strategy. And uh, I probably come with more questions than answers, so uh, we could maybe have a discussion later on, but uh, hopefully you'll get something out of this. But before I start talking, you all should have a card like this. If you don't have one, just ask Maya or Andres. And what I want you to do is to meet your neighbour. Meet the person sitting next to you. And uh, I'll give you five minutes for this. I'm going to put a timer up. I would like you to take turns each to speak to the person next to you, ask them for their name, where they work for and what their role is, and ask them and write down what their organisation mission is, who their target audience is, and what content do they produce at the moment for these audiences. And I'll put the timer up now. You have five minutes to talk to one or two people around you and write it all down. <laughs> and your time will start now. And uh, now it's my turn to, to talk, so uh, yes, I would appreciate if you listen. <laughs> um, so today what I'm going to talk about is some aspects of content strategy. And let's start with some definitions. I still feel that this definition by the uh, Content Strategy Alliance is probably the most appropriate, uh, which says that getting the right content to the right user at the right time through strategic planning of content creation, uh, delivery and governance. So that's the, the first that I will be referring to throughout the presentation. And the second is by Christina Halverson, who obviously uh, some of you will know has written lots of books and does lots of conferences on content strategy and is a great, great lady and very inspirational. And she's written that the content strategy plans for the creation, publication and governance of useful, usable content. So they're very similar. They all came about in sort of uh, hers is from 2008. And I'm not sure exactly when the Content Strategy Alliance's one is from, but I feel that they are both before the times of uh, social networks. But they're still very relevant um, uh, because content strategy is really, I think, about developing quality content that will help you engage audiences with your organization and your mission at the end of the day. Um, it is about creating a methodology that is reliable and repeatable in a way. But let's think about what, what we mean by content, because we all talk about content. Yeah? So this quote is probably the most influential quote today in the content strategy, content is king, which was um, something that Bill Gates said in 1996. Um, but when Bill Gates said that content is king, what he meant is that content is king in relation to the internet, that internet is nothing without the content. Internet is really just a vehicle. And actually the content is something that helps organizations of all kinds and individuals talk to each other. Uh, so that, that was kind of his perspective on, on that. And I think it's important to know that when you start referring to content as king, if you want to. But uh, some people went uh, further than that. So um, this guy, uh, Chris Brogan, has written an article about it. And Mark uh, Smichiklos made this uh, nice uh, visual, which I've nicked, um, to say that content is not a king or a queen. Um, and that the content is actually, we are the kings or queens. And uh, content is a currency. And I think that's something that Marcel also, you refer to content as a currency uh, yesterday. And that's something that we can use to build relationships with audiences, users, consumers, however you, you, you call them. But I will go further than that. And this is something that bothers me. Is this content? I think it is. Um, and uh, lots of people would say the same thing. There's lots of articles that you can find about it because content is UX, user experience, and user experience is content. I think the two are really inseparable. It's like, sort of like a chicken and egg situation. What came first? I, I don't know. But again, something that is worth thinking about when you think about content. Content isn't just words, isn't just video. It's about producing some experiences for our audiences, especially relevant, I think, to museums and cultural uh, institutions. Um, but one thing 
for me is uh, certain that no matter how we define what is content, is it experience or isn't it, um, what matters to our audiences is this content and it's all about content. And I won't say some rude words, but you can read them. Uh, and it doesn't matter, uh, I mean, no matter what platform it is delivered on, what matters is content. And at the heart of any experience is content, is information, our stories that we produce, our conversations that we produce or engage our uh, audiences in. But here is a million dollar question. What makes a great content strategy? I don't know. What I was thinking of doing today is to look back through the definition and maybe we can try together and define what the great content strategy is or at least give you some tools by which you will be able to define that for your institutions because I wouldn't really know. We are all <laughs> living different uh, and work in different conditions. But um, so I think that the uh, answer to this question could be hidden in, in this one. So it is all about right content. It is about the right users and it is about the right time. So let's start with the users because everything always should start from the users, um, if you ask me, and m most, more and more people agree with that and that's a kind of a mantra that you've been hearing from, I think, just about everyone uh, in this uh, seminar. So the internet has changed this definition of uh, what museums' uh, audiences are and how we interact with them. So let's say, for example, at Tate, at all four galleries, uh, we, in the last uh, financial year, we had around seven million visitors uh, to all four galleries. Is that funny? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a population of... Uh, <laughs> well, forget about the scale, but um, that's not the point I wanted to, to make. For, yeah, it's seven visitors, let's say. And, uh, but it also has a substantial digital presence. Um, th this is how uh, it was presented in Tate's annual report. So all this information again is available to you on, on our website. Uh, so the website uh, attracted around 12 million uh, visitors. Uh, we had uh, more than 600,000 <laughs> Facebook likes in a year, um, over 1 million Twitter followers, and more than 800,000 Google followers. So that was uh, towards the end of uh, 2014. So of all these millions of people, who are interacting with our gallery online, only a very small percentage are ever gonna visit. So what we are experiencing now is that this existence of the web as a platform, as a new, new space, has added this new dimension to the museum's relationship with its audiences. And it's nothing new. I think JJ today also talked about this and I was thinking whether to take this slide out as irrelevant, <laughs> but I didn't in the end. So nowadays we are constantly asking ourselves how to extend the rela relationship with visitors beyond their time at the museum and whilst they're still within the museum walls and beyond. So when we talk about time, we refer to it before, during and after visit. And that's the mantra we use. Well, also one of the buzz phrases, before, during and after the visit, before, during and after the visit. So when is the right time? Should be the right time for them, for these audiences, not the right time for us. And uh, so when is the right time to engage with audiences? Well, it depends really on who you consider the, the right users are. So once again, in order to create this great content strategy, you would need to do a bit of research. So I'll show you and bore you with some more information, but I think you like that. Um, so here is, you know, you need to find out why they're visiting again. Um, something I mentioned last time, this time, uh, I'm presenting you some research we did uh, with the audiences around mo usage of mobile um, devices in the gallery. So the research is from January 2013 and we worked with the National Gallery in London and Imperial War Museums and we together did a survey which was cheaper and also gave us different perspectives and we found some things that worked for one institution didn't work for the other and so on, which is also a very interesting finding. So I would suggest that if you're going for research, it, it's very good to do it with other institutions that you might think are similar to you, but actually in some ways they're very, very different uh, in terms of their audiences and expectations they might have of your institutions. But uh, this uh, research is still relevant. I don't think that anything really changed in those um, two, two years. And so, for example, we know that 22% of our visitors come because they have a personal interest. Uh, in the subject matter uh, museum. They 18% want to improve their own 
knowledge or understanding of history. Uh, they want some enjoyable place to pass their time and so on and on. But also, we know which proportion of visitors engage with our content before, during and after the visit to one of the galleries. Um, as you can see, most of them engage before and then there is a dip during the visit, obviously, and then uh, again they engage with some kind of content after the visit. So before the visit, we know the type of content or activities that they're engaging with and exactly on what devices also, they do that before their visit. So you see, before they're visiting, they are uh, looking for information on desktop, and then so a little less than uh, uh, that on so the mobile and uh, tablet. And what they're searching for are visiting information and what's on, and uh, they're signing up for emails, which is nice. Um, during their visit, they're taking photos, and they're still searching for visiting information. And after their visit, they go back to their desktops and they want to find out more about particular exhibits and recommend the gallery to friends or uh, families. But we also found out sort of what kind of content they really like to engage with whilst they're uh, visiting. So they're mentioning wall captions mostly, in-venue guides and printed guides. But also this is a trick, I think it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy somehow because they do for content that we do produce. So if you don't produce something, how will you know that they would like something? So just kind of have, have that in mind and don't take statistics just uh, for granted. So if you knew all this about your audiences, go back to the beginning when you did the exercise, how would that influence your plans for creation, distribution and promotion of content? Yeah, so if you have a little bit of research, then you start thinking differently about the content you are producing, so research and user-centric thinking, again, is very important. So that brings me back to the right content um, issue. So many museums have chosen to create more content as opportunities for digital engagement, which is fine. But, and this is something that Tate has been doing as well. So is, the, is more content the right content? I don't know, I'm asking a question. Uh, I really, really don't know. But uh, the, there is this feeling that the online content expands our museum audiences and makes it potentially a global one. And museums produce content for websites, for apps, for uh, new types of um, digital online magazines to expand these opportunities to involve uh, these online audiences. But is this the right strategy for you, for your organization? I think it's an important question for yourself to, to ask. And, or should we be environmentally friendly more and recycle more rather than produce more and more uh, content? Because some are kind of criticizing this approach, uh, saying that we are ger generating all this content in an environment that is arguably already saturated, and we are contributing to that attention deficit that Marcella was also talking about. And I was glad you did not use the same infographic, but uh, very similar, thank you. Um, but maybe your museum's content does not need to have that global reach. Maybe you should stay local. Maybe you should stay together with your mission, get people through the doors. Um, you know, may maybe when there is so much content is offered, and so little seems to attract sort of audiences, maybe your goal should be to sort of care more about your mission in terms of the research and collection care, rather than trying to spend all your time reaching this global audience and getting likes and followers and numbers. And what does it mean at the end of the day? So I said, oh, we'll have lots of questions. So these are all questions. I, uh, I don't have the answers. So, could it be that less is more? Do we want more of the same? Or do we want to do something completely different? I mean, these are three different strategies that you can, you can take. And this is what you as a content, every one of you is probably here because you have a little bit of a content strategist in, in, in your job descriptions. And, uh, and this is what you will be thinking about. And this is what you need to decide for your own institution. Um, so this is where you need to decide whether to have a website or not. I mean, the recent trend, I don't know if you heard, the fa Facebook is approaching more and more publishers to try and offer Facebook as a content platform, as a CMS, basically. 
So you don't need, they're saying, you don't need a website. Just come and use Facebook, post your content, and you'll get more reach. Uh, is that maybe the strategy you want to take? Or do you want to be more focused on social media and social platforms? Um, do you want to bring more visitors to the website? Or do you want to have more followers? And would you want more audience engagement or people reading your articles? What, what, what do you want is all that you will be, obviously, thinking about. But so what is that right content at the end of the day? I can only tell you what the current trends uh, are and what some research had proven to be working within certain in environments. So I'll just now take you through something that I think could be the right content for you and you can probably just pick and choose. Um, so first of all, I think the right content is the most useful and relevant content to your audiences. So for that, the easiest thing is to look at your Google Analytics if you have a website look at the long tail keywords that people are searching for and how do they come through Google or search on your website? What are they searching for and not getting or you are not producing uh, enough of that sort of content? And give them that content, give them that content in different uh, formats. So if they're searching for certain artists and you don't have that content, start producing that content. I think it's probably the easiest one that you can do fairly quickly and something that we are uh, definitely doing more and more at Tate, for example. I would also argue that museums are God-given for evergreen content, so-called, uh, which is the SEO-friendly content. Um, in, in terms of that content, it would include all the biographies you might have about artists, uh, all the glossary terms, uh, your long-form research papers, exhibition information, catalogues, um, interviews with um, artists, um, guides, and so on and on. So when you create evergreen content, this is what uh, Google likes. It likes titles such as how to do something, top 10 artists, who was such and such, what is this or that movement, uh, top tips on how to become an artist, or DIY guide to X, Y, and Z. All of this is something you can see that different businesses who don't have content are producing. Um, and we are experts on that. The, what is not evergreen content are press releases, news articles that are not going to be relevant tomorrow, uh, seasonal or trendy content, uh, International Women's Day. Yes, it's relevant for one day, but then people forget about it. And statistics, which get old the day after you publish them. And I mentioned the content marketing, and at Tate what we do, sometimes when we talk about content, we actually mean content marketing and vice versa. And I do have a problem with that, because I think that marketing content always, for its objective, has got revenue. And this is what it does well. Yes? So if you have uh, an online shop, if you're selling products, yes, write blogs about your products, write uh, ideas and how you came about, et cetera, et cetera. But the main point of that article would be to buy and that is content marketing but actually evergreen content is something that we have lots of we have institutions full of subject matter experts and i think we should use that that's our biggest uh, asset that's why google wants to work with museums and that's why google has created the google art institute because they don't own that content they're inviting us to create that content for them so i just wanted to say that uh, that difference um, another right content could be your editorial <coughs> content, which is, becomes evergreen content. And the, the greatest example in the museum sector has been the Walker Arts Center when they uh, published their website. I think it was in 2012. And it's still very relevant. And they had a huge success in terms of the amount of people who were coming to their website and in terms of their brand changing and becoming from a local museum, becoming uh, from a local art center, let's say, uh, becoming a global art center. And what they do, how they do it, they create original high quality content, plus they also aggregate content from, from elsewhere. So they're becoming like a news channel. And we should all do this. This is, this is just amazing. But for that, for example, at the same time as Walker Art Center were uh, producing their, redesigning their website, Tate was redesigning its website. I still have wireframes of something like this being planned for Tate. And we wanted to make that into a news RT News channel, uh, the whole website. However, we didn't get the, the, the backing from the top. People did not understand that in 2010 what is content marketing, what is editorial, why do we need editorial team at state, and so on and on. 
and Walker jumped in and they, they were the first ones to do it. But there is still, I think, also in Latin America, lots of space for all of you. Kind of, let's see who is going to be the first one to do this. But this is an excellent, the right way to, to go for them. Definitely. And the problem with Tate was, for example, that our marketing uh, was very uh, uh, strong uh, minded and they still did not understand the difference between, as I said, the editorial content, content marketing, which was just a became, beginning to be, become a buzzword and advertising. So still we just wanted an image that looked exactly the same as the poster and uh, no difference, no clickable text, nothing because it needs to take the brand from <laughs> wherever visitors see you, kind of on the tube, on the poster, they have to see the same thing on the website. There was no understanding that you can do digital native uh, content. And uh, whereas for Walker, marketing is seen as a secondary secondary issue. They understood that uh, at the top of the organization before I think uh, Tate's leadership understood that. The, then something that is also be becoming very influentially good content for organizations, for museums, is user-generated content. This is an image, unfortunately, I can't show you. Um, uh, it's an animated GIF um, that a colleague of mine who works with young people has done a call out to, to different um, young people audiences via Tumblr to kind of work with a uh, part of Tate's collection that's out of copyright, very important, uh, and to create some uh, animated GIFs, then they invited them for an event late at Tate event that happens on a monthly basis at Tate Britain, and uh, they had a party and they sort of celebrated this. And this has been a very hugely, hugely successful way to work with, with young people and involve them through the platform where they are, find those people where they are and offer them content that really excites them. And th th this is a great way, again, of how, how content can, can help you work with the audiences. On the other side, you have this kind of user-generated content, which is like user responses. So for example, this, is a, this was a, a wall uh, in the Tate Turbine Hall, uh, new, newest part of the, of the Tate, Britain, uh, Tate Modern Gallery, where we ask visitors to leave us their comments so we gave them an option to do it in uh, paper and pen, but also they could just tweet and their tweets would appear on the walls of the gallery. Um, so uh, again, uh, another way of uh, creating content together with your users. Um, History Pin is an example that um, initiative done by Europeana, um, where they are using crowdsourcing content. So none of the content that they produce, but they're asking people to send them their archive images from different times and eras. And uh, so it's a kind of fully crowd crowdsourced uh, content based um, platform. So lots of ideas there. Also something that um, unfortunately I didn't have a Wi-Fi today, so I couldn't uh, take a screen grab. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you've heard that the Welcome Collection in London has done probably in the museum sector the first digital story uh, uh, they just uh, published it, I think, in January, December, January, and I, w I would uh, urge you to go and to see how they've done it. They uh, created this immersive um, digital storytelling experience called Minecraft, which was done for their exhibition. So you can go and have a look. They, uh, if you haven't, have you seen it? Yeah, some some people have seen it already. Um, it's it's a great example of something that obviously in journalism we already seen being created uh, by the New York Times and the Guardian and so on and on. So there's been this kind of a trend of dig in digital uh, storytelling that museums definitely need to look look at. Uh, if we would like to uh, change the way we talk um, and produce content. Uh, then obviously the right content is always accessible uh, content um, and it is important to be able to offer content to right audiences at the right time. So in terms of the um, uh, gallery experiences and during the visit um, uh, content, I think the big breakthrough this year and uh, uh, last year it started and this year will be the uh, iBeacons, the new little transmitters that uh, also Apple have introduced that are going to help us for different audiences to find content as and where they are. And I mean, there are lots of lots of opportunities. Um, Dutch museums have been the first ones to embrace uh, iBeacons. So they, they have, there's lots and lots of uh, projects. Currently, Van Gogh Museum is also doing, has done a project with iBeacons. And the same company is also working with some uh, kind of in the music industry as well. So um, there's lots of opportunities to do sort of audio tours and sort of leaving audio archive across, you know, on the street and talking to sculptures and so, so many possibilities. I mean, you, you name it, but um, 
this is just one uh, example, and they've done a brilliant uh, uh, trailer for, for the app, so I thought it would be worth um, showing it to you. So that could be the right content for you. Also, uh, thinking about content to increase your audience um, information retention, I think it's important to deliver content in multiple formats, so to not just focusing on one format, but really looking at what is that your audience want, and then creating different kinds of formats for uh, different media. So whether it's a kind of advertising media or uh, in digital, in gallery, um, and uh, on social platforms as well. So each, each platform has got its sort of own rules of play. So just you kind of have to follow, follow those rules and their players. Um, so this is just an example of kind of platform tailored uh, content uh, of where how Tate is engaging, for example, and, and creating content for Pinterest. So we're looking at kind of visually striking images and for example Tate online shop trying to increase the e-commerce is very active on Pinterest as well and just for example they've nowadays commissioning new types of photography just for uh, Pinterest showing on Pinterest because they recognize what what works better what people click more on pin more etc etc also important is to find your niche in terms of content so you can experiment with different content formats but then really try and be recognized for one of those. So Tate, for example, has been doing the video production for year, years, and it's famous, I believe, in the museum world as someone who is doing good quality um, video uh, content format. And uh, this shows you an example of the Meet Tate Britain series uh, of films, which was uh, done in collaboration with different um, artists uh, from sort of the realm of music, uh, with fashion designers, um, chefs, and so on and on, to try and inspire people uh, through these uh, big sort of advocates and uh, big kind of PR figures to come to, to Tate Britain. And we wanted to change the image of Tate Britain because our audiences are quite old for that gallery in comparison to, to other venues that we have. So we wanted to bring some more kind of a younger, under 35s uh, to, to the galleries. And we recognize that they all love uh, video. So that was our main asset, strong point. So more video was produced uh, for this one. But there are also other institutions who are, for example, well recognized in terms of their podcasts, or maybe they're producing more of a kind of slideshows and image-led content, maybe for their photography, uh, or guides, or blogs, I mean, you name it. But maybe you can also write content for you, could be to find a niche content, uh, something that has not been done with your kind of uh, around your competitors, and you can become famous for, 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 for that. <laughs> Um, and then it's important to do content that is viral. I mean, this is my favorite, favorite example of uh, ugly Renaissance babies. Have you seen it? No. You, s you see, it's so viral. <laughs> and it started back in 2011. And a colleague of mine uh, uh, emailed us uh, uh, three months ago, like, oh, have you seen this? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's still going. And if you go on the website on Tumblr, you will see that actually they um, had people, you know, kind of posting like a few days ago. And it's unbelievable. It's not been done by a museum, but by all means, we, we own these kind of works of art. Why, why don't we do this kind of stuff? You know, it uh, just kind of um, blows my mind. It's, it's unbelievably brilliant. <laughs> or oh, this is the latest also, which was done uh, by a New York-based uh, uh, designer. Hyo Hong, I'm looking at you. Is that how you pronounce it? Um, he's a New York based by uh, uh, Selborne, a uh, Korean uh, artist who has used uh, Cindy Sherman's uh, portrait to create emojis. And this is now all over the internet. I don't know actually whether people are using it, but what a great way. I hope he uh, cleared the copyright uh, as, uh, with Cindy Sherman. But um, it, it's amazing like what you can do with a bit of creativity. I mean, we, there, there's no reason why we can't do this as institutions. Yeah, you just need to make a brainstorming and direction on what is it you want to, to do. So to go viral, um, some research has shown um, uh, that long-form content is actually more viral than short-form content. And I can tell you, look, that was by, oh, I can't find it. I lost my reference in that one. But uh, there was one marketing agency who did the research of uh, hum, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, 100,000 articles. They compared how viral those have gone. And they concluded that long form content is like 1,000 words is about the right size for, for content to go viral. Uh, and also, obviously, image led uh, content 
and uh, sort of uh, having that surprise effect, uh, like Cindy Sherman uh, or Renaissance Babies, works really, really well. So they'll do some quirky stuff and, uh, and it will go viral. And uh, right content, well, you need to analyze your content to know whether it is right content or not. So going back again to evaluation, um, which uh, might really believe in. And uh, so evaluating the content for quality and for success is very important too, because you need to constantly reiterate uh, your, your approaches about that constant transformation and constant thinking, whether we are doing the right things and how we can do it maybe better and uh, some stuff people get bored of. Um, so you, you need to invent yourself. That's what all the good big brands do anyway. So we should learn from them. So this is just an example uh, that um, is from one of my previous uh, presentations on the management of analytics, uh, which just shows you, for example, that you should have some KPIs for each uh, uh, content. So if you have a blog, what is your goal with that blog? What are your objectives? What are the metrics that you will use? And then what is your target? So go back to put these in the beginning, go back to them and analyze your content, see how well you're doing and compare that to some other stuff you're doing so you'll see like where you should put your money. Also, it's very easy to do A-B testing. There is a great tool we use a day called Optimizely uh, to do lots of A-B testing on, on our website. Uh, but this is another a tool um, which is used, for example, for tweets. So you can do A-B testing even of um, social uh, media content to see what gets and of more, sh more shares. So again, something that can help you decide whether your content is a success, how successful it is. Um, and uh, this is my final kind of uh, strategy advice for, for you today, to know your audiences, to create content for your audiences, to find your niche, to keep it useful, usable, engaging and consistent, and to promote your content, which is very important. No one is just going to come to your content. So yes, everything that JJ was talking to you about social media today, take that into account and come to her workshop after this. So she's going to have lots of stuff to say in that one. And um, analyze your content. And also, most importantly, build a content strategy that is achievable for your organization, for your resources, and sustainable. I'm uh, going to go back to your notes. <laughs> And if you now have at least one idea for what you would do differently, I would be pleased and think that I've sort of succeeded uh, today with this presentation. So um, then I think my job is done. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.